Hello, this is Tim, and this is another part of my Vampire the Masquerade 2nd Edition Old World of Darkness review. And we're going to continue with the Vampire Clans. The next one is the Nosferatu. The Nosferatu are ostracized and misunderstood by the other vampires. The hideous sewer rats live out their sordid existences in hiding. The members of this clan display the beast pretty much upon their faces and bodies, their countenances. They are normally cool-headed, some of them are depraved, but they do tend to keep their sanity longer than any of the other vampires. They, uh, they can't really interact with mortal society because they are so hideous, but they can wander around with uh, their obfuscate discipline, which basically lets them you know, stay there unseen for the most part. Um, their transformation is normally pretty painful because their face has to and their bodies change violently. And you know, that's not a very that wouldn't be a very pleasant experience to go to go through. I always experience you know, I think about the uh, the werewolves and werewolf movies and how they that looks very painful for their bodies to change that way. And the Nosferatu have gone through something similar. They tend to have more information and are the most well informed clan of vampires they just they have a usually a network of informational sources that they hear from and uh yeah that's normal what they're known for yeah I, when i ran my my uh, vampire campaign i actually had a prince that was a nosferatu which is kind of a different take on things but i really enjoyed that the uh, clan disciplines are animalism obfuscate and potence and their weakness nosferatu are so ugly that they have an appearance you know, attribute of zero. Simply cross the entire attribute off the character sheet. Nosferatu fail any action that involves their appearance. They really are hideous to behold. So that's Nosferatu, and we'll go on to the next clan. Next vampire clan are the Toreador. They are known for their hedonistic ways. These degenerates prefer to think of themselves as artists. They are involved greatly in the arts, sculpture, painting, music, etc. They claim to still be watched over by Erical, their founder. They are furiously loyal to one another and, of course, to the arts. And I'm going to spray it spread. It basically just goes into, they basically just give in to every, every sensual, sensual thing they, they can think of. They, uh, they really admire beauty um, they love to interact with mortals that are artistic um, they'll have a lot of ghouls that are artists and they tend to uh, embrace mortals and give you know give them the, the, the uh, vampire kiss as it were to make them their progeny so a lot of Toreador were originally artists in their in their human form uh, their weakness the uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Their clan disciplines are auspex, celerity, and presence. Uh, their weakness is they're often overcome by the beauty they see around them and become immobilized with fascination. Things like paintings, neon signs, even sunrises can captivate them. And obviously, uh, uh, you captivate, being captivated by a sunrise is very bad for a vampire. <laughs> it requires a successful willpower role to break this fascination quickly. Otherwise, the Toreador will stand, awed, and helpless for minutes or even hours. This trait explains why Toreador so often fall in love with mortals, especially the artistic kind. The next vampire clan are the Tremere. They weren't always blood mages. 1,000 years ago, magi from Romania took control of the clan. They embraced other magi and drank the blood of their elders. Founder is most likely dead of this clan, you know, the, the actual third generation one. They have a strict hierarchy, and their political center for them is in Vienna. So basically, this line used to be something different, or kind of different, and then something like a, you know, mage, a magi, was embraced, and that affected how everything else worked. So they kind of brought more magical nature to their bloodline. Um, these wizards are descended from an ancient legacy. The warlocks work together to increase their influence and power. And uh, these guys are very aggressive, manipulative, uh, kind of intellectual. 
Um, and again, they, they do have blood magic is pretty much uh, their their call, their trait, and uh, that is one of their, their disciplines. Um, so that's pretty much the story of them. They're basically a bunch of uh, wizards that were kind of morphed into the Tremere bloodline. And their clan disciplines are Auspix, Dominate, and Thaumaturgy, which is like blood magic. Their weakness, Tremere neonates must all drink from the blood of the seven elders of the clan when they are created. This means that all Tremere are at least one step toward being bloodbound to the clan, and therefore must watch their step very carefully when around their elders. So that kind of reinforces that strong hierarchy and uh, just kind of loyalty to their clan. They're usually pretty, pretty devoted to their clan. I would, I would say, maybe not more than others, but I guess slightly more. Uh, and that's that's pretty much the gist of the Tremere. The last main vampire clan that's listed in the second edition of uh, Vampire the Masquerade are the Ventru. And again, there are more. More bloodlines and more clans in some of the splat books, and again, if you get the revised edition, you have some of the lesser ones in there that are more, that are usually more involved with the Sabbat. But the Ventru suspect their founder was killed by a Bruja, so there's some bad blood between those two clans. More princes and Justicars come from this clan. Now, I haven't gone over Justicars yet, but they're kind of the justice dealers, I guess, of the Camarilla. They uh, pretty much go out and, you know, basically kill anyone that is breaking the, the masquerade, or and that includes princes as well. Um, the Ventura are undoubtedly the leaders of the Camarilla. They meet regularly as, as clans, as a clan, in London every seven years. And some of the other stuff. Uh, the Ventura are aristocrat aristocrats of rarefied taste and, and manner. The Blue Bloods are leaders of cool cunning. And they're very uh, old fashioned and tradition bound. Um, they're sophisticated, genteel, they believe in good taste. Uh, they're most often found among the upper crust of society. They usually have uh, almost a monopoly on political control of a city, or they're definitely like in the, the primogen, the, uh, the elders. They, they normally advise the prince. But again, that doesn't always have to be the case. You can do whatever you want with your chronicle. That's just what they suggest. Their clan disciplines are dominate, fortitude, and presence. And their weakness, they uh, they have a, a kind of a rarefied taste even when it comes to blood. The player must pick a restriction on the type of blood her character can feed upon. For example, only young men, no animals, only virgins, only girls over a certain age. Uh, it can be whatever you and your storyteller can come up with. My, I had a player who only uh, could only feed on 18-year-old girls. That was his restriction. And uh, there were several times in the campaign where he's really hungry and he was just in a bad part of town where 18-year-old girls don't hang out. <laughs> you know, so, so that was a, a definite weakness for him. Um, the character will feed on no other type of blood not even if she is starving or under duress. So the Ventru are usually the movers and shakers. They like to stay on top of the political situation, and they're usually in places of power. All right, so we've gone over some of the vampire clans and what their weaknesses are, what their disciplines are, and we'll continue. Uh, some, some quotes I, I, I thought were interesting. Humanity no longer fears the dark. It no longer realizes it should. This kind of brings in that horrific element of, of the unknown and how that really kind of bugs us as people, as humans, I guess. Uh, many governments seem blind to the existence of the Canites. Canaanites. Um, the masquerade seems like it's been mostly successful. Um, they, the book kind of does hint at certain elements of society, um, certain elements of religious institutions that have sort of a, a vague idea that they exist or that it's been passed down that they exist, but whether or not everybody believes that or not in that organization. Let me give some examples. The Society of Leopold is a smaller version of the Inquisition, um, and the Camarilla has decreed to leave them alone at all costs. Uh, better to let them think they know what's going on than to actually show them by uh, having some vampire mess up. 
the Arcanum, which was formed in the 1800s. And they're an older group called the White Monks, and that's where their, their history lies, I guess. Um, and they have some, they had some influence with the Inquisition as well. Uh, they basically are also told to be left alone, but they're they're more watchers and they collect information of the the various supernatural things that go on, supernatural creatures. Um, but again, the Camarilla doesn't want to mess with them and change things. So let's see. Okay, uh, there's also the relationship between kindred and werewolves that it goes into, and again, the vampires don't like the werewolves. Werewolves don't like the vampires, and that's just how it is. <laughs> you can, uh, in, in a campaign I ran, I had uh, a bigger, badder enemy, and uh, they, both werewolves and kindred, had to work together so that both of them would survive. And as soon as the bigger threat was, you know, taken care of, they went back to their old ways and decided to hate each other. <laughs> but uh, that was actually a really fun campaign. Uh, it just fell apart because of uh, kind of poor attendance and... Uh, I was running on a Saturday, and Saturday doesn't seem to be a good, very, a very good day to run things, because there's always weddings and family, family reunions, etc. But that's off topic. So yeah, so the vampires don't go out of the city very much. The werewolves don't really go into the city very much. And again, there are exceptions, but that's pretty much the uh, kind of like the stereotype. Talks a little bit about magi, magicians. Um, these are the magicians of great power. These aren't just like, you know, your illusionists that you see on TV. Uh, and these magi follow the uh, tradition of the Order of Hermes, and they sort of also maintain a masquerade. Um, the werewolves have the veil, which uh, people just get really scared, and they, they don't, don't really remember what they saw. They just think they saw like a big dog. So all of the different Old World of Darkness lines have some sort of protection built in where they they can kind of interact with moral society somewhat and kind of still be hidden. Um, ghouls are uh, basically mortals that drink vampiric blood and they haven't been drained of all their blood yet. This extends their life. Um, it also kind of makes them sort of addicted to that blood. And they also become usually blood bound pretty easily because after they drink three times, they're blood bound, and they have to pretty much do, for the most part, what they, what their, their vampire that has given them blood says to do. Um, and you basically have to have permission from the prince to make one, because it technically breaks the tradition of the masquerade, because a human being knows that you're a vampire, unless you can kind of hide that fact a little bit. Maybe you can just slip it in there. You know, I don't know. <laughs> There could be some interesting things you could do with the Chronicle with that, where you don't actually tell them what you are. Um, if they have a year with no blood, they no longer become bloodbound, and a month without blood, they're immortal again. Uh, and they give they get some very minor disciplines because of the blood that they drink. And there's another section on the generations. Um, again, the more distance you, you are from Cain, the weaker you are, the less powerful your disciplines are. Um, Cain is the founder, you know, the biblical slayer of Abel, and it was said that he was cursed by God, and uh, that kind of brings in the whole uh, vampires are damned thing, and I really think it works for for the setting. You know, you can have the setting where you know, okay, well, we don't believe in God or whatever, but the fact that he's there and you're damned by him is, I think it just it fits. It just it I don't know I. Uh, I might be biased, but I really like that flavor. I really like that, um, yeah, God exists, but he hates us. <laughs> we are, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going up there when we die, you know, that sort of thing. So that just kind of brings in that tragic, horrific, you know, element of the game, I think. And it goes to the second generation and third generation, uh, fourth and fifth. I think I'm going to run out of time on this one, though. So maybe I'll go into the generations in the next video. All right, guys and girls, I'll see you guys later.